You want more on the abs? You got it. Honestly, does it really matter right now? That's the problem, right? No, just about anybody can get in front of a microphone and talk about hockey. <laughs> How on earth do you get involved in something like this? It was kind of a fluke. It's funny that this podcast is going off the rails so quickly. This is from the Chief Seats, an Avalanche fan podcast from Nine News. Seated in the conference room, here are your hosts, Steve Steger and Jeff Sautel. Hey, that last uh, soundbite, we can actually get that in real time here, because joining us live, well, live, I keep calling this live, it's, I'm really forgetting that it's not on the air, uh, on from the Cheap Seats, Ryan S. Clark from The Athletic. How's How are you, going? buddy? Good. How are you guys? Good. Uh, good to have you along. No, thank you for having me. It's weird to hear my voice in the intro, because like, every time I do a phone interview, it's like, I'm a real boy named Pinocchio, <laughs> and then, like, when I'm actually live in person, it's like, now. Butch, your L.A. rights have been revoked. <laughs> <laughs> and if you've never seen Pulp Fiction, then I'm just going to walk away. I've seen Pulp Fiction. Okay. Absolutely. I, I could I, not quote yeah. it to that level. Let's oh, put it that I can way. quote it. You can ask my wife. Like I can quote it like incessantly. <laughs> yes. By the way, and your wife is off camera in, in the audience. She does uh, not want right to be now. shamed. She does not want to be shamed. <laughs> well, are we interrupting date night? No, the, not really. I, I mean, like at first, because at first we were like, ah, let's go out. But then it's like, well, they've got camp so early tomorrow morning that like we'll just make date night Saturday and we'll just hang in. We'll just grab food and hang out tonight. So yeah. there you go. You know our date plans, Denver. Congratulations. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> we'll Steve. Post, hey. We'll post this online immediately. So if anyone's stalking you, they can get right to hey, it. From the Cheap Seats exclusive. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you had an early morning this morning. A little bit. A busy couple of days, right? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, the Avalanche officially opened training camp today. I mean, yesterday, well, Thursday was media day, and they brought out about, what, seven or eight players, everyone from Nathan McKinnon to Pierre Wood Belmare to Nazem Kadri, Philip Grubauer, and, of course, Jared Bednar at the end. And then today they had two morning sessions that lasted about, let's say, 90 minutes to two hours each in length. And so it was typical skate. You see drills. It's everyone from NHL guys, AHL guys, their prospects who play major junior, guys on an amateur tryout. And then at the end, they did uh, skating as well, like wind sprints. And then you have to talk to people after. So, I mean, it was one of those things where it's just, it was, how do I put this? I love hockey. So, I mean, I'm fine with it being at a rink all day. But yeah, I mean, it was a lot of the same thing over and over again. But again, it's the first day of preseason. What do you expect? There are a lot of people who, who live and die by this, who would go to training camp to watch the wind sprints. Well, it's interesting because today's camp, it was the most packed I've ever seen. So you think about last year's camp, let's say like half the, the crowd was full. And then today, it felt like at least a good two to 300 people were there. They had signs. They were wearing their jerseys. And afterwards, I was walking out with Lauren Jabbar from Altitude. And there was a line of fans waiting outside the Avalanche Grill for autographs, and players just stood there. Did you signed. sign them? No. no, no oh, they weren't waiting for yours. No, no, no. No one knows why. I like oh. to keep it that way. <laughs> but yeah, there's a camera right there. So gee, thanks. Yeah, you were really excited when we put the camera. Oh yeah, over I was here. just. Oh, I was just thrilled. I was like, hopefully this one breaks. This is what we we draw people in by saying we're taping a podcast, and they think, okay, cool, I can just you know, fly. and then they realize, oh, this is a TV station. So. See, see, there you go. <laughs> News nine line all the time. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> It's, we're, we're the media. That's what we yeah, do. Yeah, I was going to say, your we new tagline should be, if it's, not, <laughs> if it's not a lie, it's not on News 9. Sorry, <laughs> Steve Stager. Nine News, by the way. I said uh, that on purpose just for a reason. Yeah, I know you did. Uh, so let's talk about uh, Miko Rantanen, who is the topic du jour. Uh, we've been talking about two things since this podcast started, both Miko Rantanen and Altitude, which... Uh, they seem to be. Uh, you could. You could be toss a toss up. What contract will get done first? If you, Altitude with the big three or Miko Rantanen. If you were a betting man, which one would you say gets done first? For now, we'll say Miko Rantanen, just because that one, in all seriousness, is far less complicated. Because with Altitude, you're dealing with three carriers. That one of them, I believe, it's what Directv is a little bit more stringent on sports. Dish has kind of come out and said that they're not really trying to offer sports, and Comcast seems like it would be the most reasonable of the three. But they're trying to work with those three. They're looking at Amazon and other alternatives. Whereas with Miko Rantanen, it is just essentially two people you're dealing with, his representative, Mike Liute, and then Miko himself. So let's hear what uh, Gabe Laniscog had to say about Miko Rantanen. I honestly don't think we're too worried about it. It's going to get sorted out. You know, when you look around the league, he's not the only one. So um, obviously you miss him, but, you know, we're not too worried about it. So that was the, that seems to be the company line on Miko Rantanen. Uh, is that right? That's about what you would expect. Just because, I mean, it's a dressing room that there are guys that they stay in contact, they care, but at the same time, they don't ever want to really get involved in someone's financial situation. Because at the end of the day, your teammate's trying to get paid what he thinks he's worth. and at the But also, you have that toe the line of you want to be a good teammate and a friend, 
but you also play for this organization. So, I mean, it's normal for guys to, to sort of say that, but in sense of the on-ice component, we saw a little bit of that Friday in terms of, okay, what does temporary life without Miko Rontanen look like? So on that first line, you saw Gabriel Landeskog at left wing, Nathan McKinnon at center, and Andre Burakovsky, who they traded for from the Washington Capitals, he was on the first line. And there was a sequence where McKinnon and Burakovsky were just flying down the ice, two-on-one, McKinnon makes a saucer pass past the defenseman, Burakovsky scores, it gets some reaction from everybody on the ice as well as the, the crowd. And then with, when the three of them were put together, I mean, they were able to do some things, but like Jared Bednar said, there was a little bit of moment, a few moments when they were kind of fighting the puck, the three of them. But at the same time, it is a good alternative given the circumstances and the fact that Burkowski is six foot three. He's 201 pound. Miko Ranson, of course, 6'4", 220. So again, you do have size on that right wing. But again, you're talking about someone, Andre Burkowski, who he's a good player that's yes to really find consistency. Whereas if with Miko Ranson and you're talking about someone who the last two seasons has shattered the 80-point barrier. And if it wasn't for injuries where he was limited to 74 games, the projections have him scoring around 96 points. Does this season start without Miko here? It could. I mean, You think it could? I mean, that's just it. Is it you never know. Because, I mean, of course, as right before we started recording this podcast, and we're going to get into it in bigger picture, but yeah. Mitch Marner signs his deal. And people kind of think, like, well, Marner was going to be the domino for all the forwards to start. But that's and it's just, uh, six years, about, like, upwards of $10 million a Six year. years in the AV is, I think, 10, 8, 9, or 10, 9, 8. It's, it's one of those two, but either way, it's really close to the $11 million figure. The, the, the thing about Marner and all these RFAs, and it's been written about on our site, other ones, you name it, is there's similarities and there's differences. So you look at the Toronto Maple Leafs. That's a team that now has three of the seven highest AAVs in the NHL. Give me, give me a, a breakdown of what AAV is, because I think a lot of these things get glazed over sure. by, by people, including me. I mean, I am no expert in this. What's an RFA? What's an AAV? What's Sure. So we'll start with AAV. So AAV is average annual value, which is how much is that contract worth each year of the deal? What's the average value of that deal? Whereas if RFA is a restricted free agent, what that means is the team has your, your rights until you're 27, and then you become an unrestricted free agent, which means you're free to talk to anybody. That's pretty much the difference between the two. And so with Mitch Marner, the thought has been, because he's asking for the most, and because he's in a team that, again, is how do I put this? Like In some ways, people joke Toronto is the center of the universe, so the thought is once that's kind of taken care of, then everything else will kind of trickle down. But there are some people who feel like it's so much of a different situation because in Toronto, you have three players making north of t- at least $10.8 million. whereas if you look at the Colorado Avalanche, no one's come work close to that. Now, the thing with Miko Ronson in the Avalanche is this. He's going to be this team's highest paid player. No, one in, no one's arguing that. The issue is what's going to be the term, what's going to be the dollar amount, because keep in mind, like if you're the Avalanche, you want the right term, you want the right dollar amount, because in the next four years, you're going to have Gabriel Landeskog, you're going to have Kale McCarr. Granted, he's an RFA, but Gabriel Landeskog is the UFA. You're going to have Philip Grubauer to worry about, and you're also going to have Nathan McKinnon to worry about, on top of just other pieces as well. So the thing you want to do if you're the Avalanche is you want to sequence it to where you only have one of those guys come up every summer over the next several years instead of all at once. And not only that, but with the salary cap being what it is, you want to be able to manage these assets because this is kind of the drawback, if there is one, about Joe Sackick building this team. While it's young and it's exciting and it has a lot of promise, if it fulfills that promise, there's a lot of dollar signs. You look at the Samuel Gerrard deal. Mm-hmm. You look at the JT Comfort deal, what we think Rontanen can get, which let's say between what, eight. What, where is that? No, yeah, I was going to say, what do you think that number it's is? It's going to be probably between eight and a half million and nine, just because, I mean, if you look at the comparables, Sebastian Ajo being one, Ajo got right in that eight four to eight five range, and that seems reasonable just because, again, with Rontanen, it's one of those things where is he really, really good? Absolutely. But when you think about the players on this planet who make $11 million or more, you are talking about really six guys, maybe seven, most NHL general managers can justify being the Sidney Crosbys of the world, uh, the Connor McDavid's and Nikita Kucherov's. I mean, I know Matthews and Marner are making that now. Patrick Kane's in that discussion. Nathan McKinnon is definitely in that discussion. I mean, again, those are the sort of figures you're talking about. And with Miko Ronson, and he's going to be a really good NHL player. He already is a really good NHL player. But he's on that border between, like, star and superstar. And if you're a superstar, then sure, that's where you can start commanding the 10. And teams kind of have to respect that. But it seems like the, that AAV is going to be between – Eight four eight five and, and nine million. If we're being realistic, and again, if you're the Abs, it's about how do you make that work within the construct of keeping this team together. Because keep in mind, 
there's going to come a day where Bowman Byram is also going to be restricted. Uh, uh, yeah. His contract's going to be up. I sure. mean, Kale, Kale McCarr, McCarr's contract. Martin, Martin Kout's going to be another one. Shane Bowers. I mean, again, like there's a lot of potential, but again, with that potential comes a price tag. Wow. I, it's a lot to think about. Uh, and the question that I keep hearing from a lot of people is, is this going to be a problem, uh, Miko making more money than Nathan McKinnon? Well, no, because here's the thing. You have to look at the way the market was at that time. And the way the market was and the way McKinnon was was this. The market at that time is, and again, this is how it, it tends to be done, is you want to look at what percentage of a salary cap does a player take up. And then that's where you do your determination. So you look at a Mike Liu, who's Miko Ronson's agent, one of his former clients, Vladimir Tarasenko, he took a certain percentage of the cap, and I want to see Tarasenko's Teres, deals like between seven and seven five. I'd have to double check, but it's within that range. And so with McKinnon, he got again the right amount of you know pie in that salary cap. But here's the other thing: when McKinnon signed that deal, he was someone that no one really knew what he could be. The potential was there, but he was someone who was a forty to sixty point a year player. He wasn't what he is now, which is. He's coming off, you know, 99 points the season before 97. He's a heart caliber trophy sort of player who, again, is one of the, the three best, five best in this league, depending on who you ask. So, again, it's, it's, it's a different circumstance. And granted, that's been talked about. But at the same time, the economics of hockey dictate that when he signed that contract, he wasn't what he was. So would you say right now, then, um, you're talking about you know, these players getting a percentage, roughly. Do you think that's mostly what the holdup is on Rotman, that – you know, the Avs say he's star, his agent says he's superstar, and you're trying to straddle that line? Well, talking to our Pierre Lebrun, I mean, who wrote about this a few days ago, Pierre was saying that with the teams and with the Avalanche, Miko Ronson, and it's less about money and more about term, which seems to be the general feeling right now. And by term, it's the length of the deal, which is, again, the way it works without hopefully getting too cumbersome is... No, and we should get cumbersome, though, because <laughs> then we understand what's going on. Yeah. So, yeah. You, so, again, going back to restricted and unrestricted free agents, so if you sign Miko Ronson in, who turns 23 in October, to, let's say, a seven-year deal, if you're the Avalanche, it's great. If you're Miko Ronson in, the argument you and your agent are going to make is, okay, so what about those UFA years, which, if it projects the way you think it can go, those are prime earning years. And you're going to be into this fixed amount, again, depending on how the contract is structured, what the cap is going to look like or what you think it could look like, you're going to be set into this fixed amount and you're going to start wondering, is this money we're leaving on the table because we wanted to sign a long-term deal? And so again, that's just really the thing right now is like, if maybe you're Mike Liu, you think five year, four or five years works. If you're the avalanche, you're not going to do that because you see the potential, you think you have the right dollar amount, you want to keep it together and also... Who's to say what that might look like in a few years? So let's say you sign him to that 8.5 target we were talking about, and he goes on to have some absolute monster years. He helps them win a cup or two. What's to stop his camp from coming back and saying at that time, again, depending on the salary cap and whatnot, we want 11, we want 12, sure. we want 13. Now that's another big price tag you've got to consider on top of McKinnon. And again, I know it's really, really early, but then you have to start thinking about like, what is Landis Gaw going to cost over the long term? What is Kale McCarr going to cost over the long term? These are all things you've got to look at. Yeah. And it, it's so hard, I think, for at least me to wrap my head around the idea of, you know, Eaton has a lot of money. Like, I would take that in a second. Yeah. It's, it's so hard. I mean, that's Ryan S. Clark money. Right. That's what it is. <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not all of us get that. Yeah. yeah. It's, well, it's, it's tough to think about. Uh, I should get to, I want to get to the question that you asked uh, uh, McKinnon that got probably the answer, I think, that everybody used. McKinnon talking about the season. Here he is. We can't even talk about the season. Here he is. But it's nice to have some pressure. We're not just the, you know, the, the bad abs or whatever anymore. We're, we're a contender, and um, that's fun. I mean, I think we all want pressure. It's no fun coming in as an underdog. It's just it got kind of old. You know, the best teams have pressure on them, and, you know, it feels good. So we're no longer the bad abs. What is that the feeling in that locker room that you're seeing right now is that, that they just they've, they've got something on their shoulder? You know, it's interesting because whether you talk to people in the dressing room or you talk to people in the front office, there's a cautious optimism in the sense of people are aware of what's at stake and what the season could be. But there's also this feeling of there's still a lot of questions. And that's why the best term to use for this team, it's questionably proven. Like there are aspects of it that are proven, like. You think this is what McKinnon, Landeskog, and Rontanen can be. Because, I mean, for as much as we talk about McKinnon and Rontanen, and deservedly so, people kind of forget, like, 
a Gabriel Landeskog not only had the best year of his career, but it's the other things he did. Like it was the way he was able to fight in traffic. He was getting certain spaces on ice. And if you look at the faceoff numbers, which again, this sounds really nerdy, he was one of their best players on the faceoff. If you look at what he does on power play one, he takes most of the faceoffs. And even when he's on the ice with McKinnon, he takes a lot of faceoffs. So there's a lot of value with that line. You know what you have in Samuel Girard in the sense he's only going to get better. Same thing with Eric Johnson. Nikita Zadorov, you know for the most part, but when you look at the way he's come into camp, I mean, he's looked leaner. He's looked a, a bit more defined. Like, you look at him and you think, okay, could this really be the year he unlocks it and becomes this sort of consistent presence everyone thinks he can be on top of what you saw from Grubauer at the end of last season in the yeah. playoffs. And you wonder if that is tested or not. Right, and that's the point. Is like There are aspects of it that make you go, okay, you take that along with what's proven in Nazem Kadri, Jonas Dunskoy, Colin Wilson, Matt Calvert, Pierre Bel- Edward Belmer, and Matt Nieto, and you think, all right, this can be a thing. But again, the questions exist in the sense of, and again, in no particular order, is one, what is Kale McCarr going to be like over an 82-game season? He looked great in 10 playoff games, but at the same time, he also had some deficiencies in the sense of, you think about that goal of Vander Kane score. Evander Kane is 6'2", 210. Kale McCarr at the time was 5'11", 187. He's about 198 now. But still, like, there's a hell of a difference between going from here are the kids you see in Hockey East week in and week out versus here is a grown man who's one of the best power forwards in the NHL in a playoff setting. There's, there's a big difference. So it's how is that going to work? It's how is this goaltending tandem? Because we just posted a story about on The Athletic about Grubauer and, and Pavel Francouz because, like, again, with Grubauer, it's can he do it over a full season? With Pavel Francouz, it's in the last three years, he's gone from the KHL in Russia to the AHL to the NHL. And is he considering he's a smaller goalie, Yes, we've seen UC Soros and Lars, Yaroslav Halak have success, but how will he have success knowing that they don't have a third goalie who is an experienced option that they can rely on right now? Yeah, who is that third goalie? They're still trying to sign him. They are still trying to sign him. That's, so they're going to have to go outside? To n- yeah, I mean, like, but the thing is, like, that's kind of the reality. And so what they're probably going to do is they're going to look into someone in free agency because there are candidates out there or they could look at other teams, like you take the Tampa Bay Lightning, which – they have two guys like Mike Condon and Louis Domingue who would be really good candidates for someone looking for a third goaltender. So you do have those options. But again, it's just, it's those sort of questions. It's what's the penalty kill going to look like now that Carl Soderberg and, and Patrick Nemeth are gone? Because people might look at that and go, okay, whatever. But Carl Soderberg did a hell of a lot for this team last year. I mean, he did a ton. He did? And yeah. now you're asking, I mean, no, granted, you have Kadri to kind of fill that load offensively, really take it up to a new level as a second line center. But now you're asking JT Comfer, who bounced around between wing and center, to be that third line center, to be that person who's counted upon on power play two, on penalty killing situations. And considering this was a team that was in the top four in penalty minutes last year, it was a kill that was constantly on the ice. So again, there's a lot of questions. You need a faceoff guy. Uh, this team has at Pierre least from Edward the fans' Belmere. perspective. Uh, yeah. And, yeah he, Belmare and Kadri are it. Because like if you look at the numbers, like Kadri is more than 50%, and Belmare hovers around 55%. And so with Kadri, that's someone that on the power play one, and again, I apologize for getting too nerdy here. but No, like, that's okay. But, this, these are the things that we talk about up in, up in the cheap seats, actually, <laughs> is we watch the face-off numbers and notice that that is, seems to be an area where the Avs have struggled and year after year. And we drink heavily when we And do. we drink quite a bit. <laughs> so let's, let's take a look at power play one. So let's just picture it to where your power play one is going to be Landis Gog, McKinnon, Ronson, and McCarr, and Kadri. Now the question you have to ask yourself is, do you put Kadri there? Do you put Landis Gog there? Do you keep McKinnon? And depending on what you do, where do you move people? Because do you move McKinnon to the wing and put Kadri at center? And do you put Landis Gog back here so you have left, right to move the puck? Are you fine going right, right with McCarr and and Landis Gog? I mean, and McKinnon? I mean, exactly what do you do? But the thing is this. You know Landis Gog can win faceoffs. You know Kadri can win faceoffs. So it's a matter of who's on the dot. And then once that happens, what's the setup from there? Because you would think Landis Gog's going to be the down low. You would think think Kadri's going to be in the middle. Makar is going to be up top at the point. And then Ronson and McKinnon are going to be on the half walls kind of facilitating everything. And like when you think about just the dangerous nature of that power play, it's quite telling. Yeah. It should, I mean, uh, it, it is quite telling. It should give folks some uh, nightmares. I mean, like they were works. the sixth best power play in the league. Yeah. And now you're talking about someone in Kadri who he's getting more time, more opportunity than what he had. Because before John Tavares got there, I mean, you're talking about someone who was a back-to-back 30-goal a year scorer. John Tavares gets there. He goes to third line. He gets production. But he's not getting the time. He comes here, he's going to get all that. Spe- and then, Speaking of Kadri, yeah. I McKinnon had something very interesting to say about him, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. I think in Toronto he was uh, 
held back a little bit. You know, he, he's a great shutdown player and he'll continue to be that, but he's got a lot of offensive upside that I don't think uh, the league has seen yet. Um, and we're definitely going to see that this year. Do you think he was held back in Toronto? It's kind of hard to say just because, I mean, I think about when Nazem Kadri was first drafted by the Leafs, seventh overall of the London Knights. The thing with first round picks in Toronto is, and I'll explain why this media market's so insane here in a second, but the thought is they're going to be the end all say I'll do all be all. And with Kadri, like he was a decent player, but he wasn't like a Matthews. He wasn't a Marner. He wasn't a Tavares. But because of the influx of those guys, he kind of gets lost. Because again, like you look at Tavares and you're talking about a top five center. You look at Matthews, you're talking about a top five center, top 10 player. You look at Marner, you're talking about someone who just came off of a 90 plus point season. And with Kadri, like, and, and also there's William Nylander. And so it's one of those things where it's like, in some ways you can see where he gets forgetting about until, you know, they play the Bruins and, you know, calamity ensues in terms of him and suspensions. <laughs> but beyond that, I mean, like, he is someone who is a skilled two-way player. It's just a matter of, like, okay, is this the place he comes where more people say, wow, I didn't realize he could do this or that. So it's going to be interesting. And, again, that goes back to the whole the theme that we had about just there's, there's questions, but there's promise as well. And with Condry, it's you know that he's proven. But the big question is, how can he be a force on a line that last year the second line went through problems? It shuffled through, like, I think, 18 or 20 it different did. combinations. Yeah, it was wild. And then you have Burakovsky, who, again, a lot of potential. But is this the place for him to prove it? And then same thing with Tyson Jost, where you no longer have to worry about, is he charged with being your second line center? He's going to be your second line left winger. And how is that all going to work? Hmm. There was something you mentioned that I want to bounce back to a little bit. Um, Kadri's sort of reputation largely due to the Bruins stuff. Right. Um, you know, that's something people have talked to me about when we were discussing when we first signed him. You know, is that like his control of himself on the ice? Is that something that's a legitimate concern or was that sort of blown out of proportion because it happened in the playoffs, everyone saw it? I mean, it's one of those things where he's certainly a tenacious player. I mean, he's aggressive in how he approaches it. I mean, he plays a two-way style that gets after people that he attacks the puck on both ends. So, I mean, that is part of it. No, I mean, like, yeah, I think if you're the avalanche, you are looking for him that when you're in a playoff situation to definitely be a, a bit more restrained because it's not saying that he wasn't valued in Toronto, but, like, he's going to be valued here. And in some ways you could almost argue a little bit more just because, okay, he's going to be on power play one. He's going to be your second line center. He's going to be one of these experienced figures that and when you look at the free agent signings they've made the last two years, what a lot of these players have in common between Grubauer, Donskoy, Ian Cole, Matt Calvert, Pierre Edward Belmere, Nazem Kadri, they are all players who've come from winning situations. They've all, they're all players who've come from series playoff, playoffs, play, excuse me, playoff places with experience, like Burakovsky, Grubauer, Cole, they all have Stanley Cups. Mm -hmm. I mean, Calvert's had some deep playoff runs, you know, Donskoy, same thing. And with Kadri, I mean, they've been bounced by the Bruins, but again, like, he knows what it's like to play in a strange, stringent seven-game series, and that's something you need from someone in such a key position. So I think if you're the Avalanche, you're hoping that experience can kind of help him and help you in the long run. Preseason coming up next week. Uh, we're excited for that because we get to go to see hockey games. We haven't done that in a while. Yeah, it'll be fun. <laughs> you get to finally cover hockey games for a while. What's the preseason like for you? Is it boring? Is no, it no. I mean, like, because here's the thing. The way I look at kind of preseason is this. It's a chance to, I guess, to kind of look at things in a sense of who's doing what, who's someone you look at for later. So, like, last year was Ryan Graves. Like, Ryan Graves had a really strong preseason. And people, I think, unless you really follow the Colorado Eagles, they were kind of like, I think they're like, oh, yeah, but like, they weren't really paying attention. But if you're an Eagles fan, you're following Ryan Graves the whole year. So that way, when he comes up and he just has to make a 55-mile drive from Loveland to Pepsi Center, he's someone that like, they feel comfortable about. They've seen a lot because he's in nearby Loveland. And as you saw toward the end of last year, like they were playing a seven-defenseman system because they wanted to get him in the lineup. Yeah, people got excited about him last yeah, year. His first NHL goal was a big deal around here. Well, and, and here's the other thing about it, too. Like, He's 6'5", about 230. So, I mean, he gives, you, he gives you size on the back end. I mean, you look at his numbers in Major Junior. I mean, he can move the puck. He, does, he did some of that with uh, the Eagles. He did some of that with the Avalanche. But above all else, it's like it goes back to depth, which, again, not to be completely nerdy, but when you look <laughs> at the third – like, I just feel so okay. bad. We, we, we're well past that. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. But, uh, but when you look at the third-line defensive pairing with Ian Cole being out for a while, at first it was supposed to be till December, but now it seems like maybe it might be sooner – like, you have to wonder, what are they going to do? And Ryan Graves is an option because he's big, he's mobile, he can skate, he can pass the puck, he's physical, he can do all these things. And so do you pair him with a Kevin Connaughton? Do you put him with Bowen Byram and see how that works? I mean, does Mark Barbario get a chance? And then what happens when Ian Cole comes back? So to have him and Cole 
as a potential shutdown pairing, and you can play him on PK. He's a versatile guy. Can we just say how wonderful it is after the last few years to be talking about this sort of defensive depth? <laughs> I mean, we're complaining are you, that are, are you who, are, who are we going to like put on this line as opposed to, oh, God, who are we going to put on this line? Are you suggesting <laughs> that uh, defensive depth wasn't a strong suit? <laughs> Uh, not for a while. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly didn't seem like it, at least for a while. Uh, why don't we take a break? When we come back, I want to talk to you about you and not no. necessarily about hockey. No. We're going to pick the mind of Ryan S. Clark and learn who is the guy who writes for The Athletic and keeps us all entertained no, on don't. Twitter. Yes, we're going to learn all about it next. In one trendy Denver neighborhood... Right next to a golf course, we find an old home almost hidden in plain sight. It's been missing for more than a year. Inside, a 69-year-old man basically disappeared. So removed from life and people, nobody knew he vanished. Well, there's no way he was there when we searched him. Unsanitary conditions hindered their investigation. No more after the coroner's report. Who's to blame? How does a man become... He was found in his own home. home. Lost at home. Check out the entire second season of Blame wherever you listen to podcasts. Back with Ryan S. Clark. And do you like Ryan Clark or Ryan S. Clark? As I always have called you Ryan S. Clark, because that's what your Twitter handle says. Um, I'll be honest. Like, I mean, I'm fine with like whatever, but it's just always weird when like in a non-professional people setting, people are like, "You're Ryan S. Clark," and I'm like, "I am not that important." So this is a horrible, embarrassing story that I will tell. So when I covered high school football in Texas, um, after games, a bunch of us would go to Hooters to watch the highlight show because the way it works in Texas is there's a state highlight show that tells you games that has highlights from every game across the state. Yeah, And And they have it on the big screen at Hooters. Yes, they do. No joke. Because, again, it is Texas. And then afterwards, we would go back to a buddy's house and we would stay up till 6 or 7 in the morning playing an NCAA football tournament. It was fantastic. (laughs) And, yes, I won it four times out of ten weeks. So Beautiful. Exactly. But So the, the thing is, it's like, at first, everyone was just like, hey, look, it's Ryan S. Clark. And then there was one day, and it's this is what they did every time I walked into a room. I walked into a room at Hooters, and everyone was like, Ryan S. Clark, Ryan S. Clark. <laughs> and like everyone in this Hooters is like, who is Ryan S. Clark? And you, I'm just like, uh, I guess me? You realize that that is like a high school kid's dream, to walk into a Hooters and have everyone cheer your name. Look, I just was going in to see some friends and eat some really bad wings <laughs> in the middle of Texas. I wasn't expecting all that. So it's just kind of like when I left that paper in Texas, I was like, you know, I'm thinking like for when I moved to North Dakota, because I was going to go there to cover hockey. Like, I'm just going to go by Ryan Clark. And like, no, damn it, you can't. Like, <laughs> this is your legacy. Ryan S. Clark. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Ryan. We should, anytime no, we don't. interview you on the phone, please we're do. keeping that around. We're gonna no, keep, please don't. Oh, we're we're going to get a, a whole chorus a of people to uh, introduce you that way. Oh, God, that's terrifying. How did you get into all this? <sighs> How did I get into this? Yeah. Um, my it, wife drove me here. Next question. Yeah, no, I'm joking. Okay. Um, <laughs> She's so, here, by the way. Yes, we, no. we were trying to get her to do something with us, but uh, yeah. she, she, uh, she declined. So. Yeah. Um, no, but to be serious, um, yeah, so what it was was just, this sounds like a really bad origin story. So it was, it was like my mom, she read to me in the womb when I was a kid. And then I think like when I was like maybe three or four, when I first started to have like cognizant memories, we would always watch nightly news with Tom Brokaw, um, Peter Jennings. I'd always read. Um, and when I was being tested, I was already on a ninth grade reading level by the time I was entering kindergarten and like around middle school level, everything else. And I just always had a fascination with journalism because I was just curious about how things work why the news is the way it is, so on and so forth. Hold on. You had a ninth grade reading level when you're going into kindergarten and you picked journalism. You know, you could be making millions of dollars in some <laughs> other profession somewhere else. Well, we'll get to that in a sec. <laughs> so, <laughs> so no, what it, so what it was was just I had always had a fascination with it. And so the middle school I went to was a magnet school where every nine weeks the premise changed. So like one of them was like, for example, your life, your business, where you learn economic principles, you get, you get fake money, you deal with the stock market, and at the end for your big presentation, you have an open market in a cafeteria where you sell a product and whoever has the most profit wins and, and this and that. And so at one point in time, I thought about becoming a financial analyst. Um, and then we also had some other streams too, but one of them um, was actually called Work Hard, Play Hard. And this was a sports stream. So our English class was a sports writing class. Our math class was a fantasy baseball class. Like, I mean, it, it, it was centered around sports and it had an Olympics at the end. Like, it was fantastic. And so, I mean, that's kind of what tipped me over the edge because I would say that before I went to college, for me, it was a three-way tie. And again, you're all going to laugh. It was a, a tie between journalism, financial analyst. Oh, so four-way tie, technically. Journalism, financial analyst, 
mechanical engineering, and, and my wife knows this because I'm starting to talk about it more recently, but I actually thought about being a CIA analyst. So the thing is, is when I was in high school, I took three years of Russian. And when I was in college... I bet journal- you that comes in handy in your current job, by the way. Yet. Um, <laughs> and so, so what it was was just when I was in college, like my background is political science. Well, my minor is political science with a concentration in Russia, Eastern Europe, and former Soviet socialist republics. And so, yeah, I thought about doing CIA um, for a little bit, but I mean, I just decided journalism was what kind of made me happy. And yeah, so from there, I graduated school from the University of Maine, and then is afterwards, it, uh, oh, go for it's it. It's still making you happy? I just want to double check. For the most part, yeah. I, I just like to check in with uh, colleagues in the industry and just make <laughs> sure everybody's still happy. You get to cover the fun stuff, but yeah. I mean, for the, for the most part, I mean. You get some tough stuff every now and then. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, like to me, it's not necessarily things about my job that frustrate me, but it's more just what's going on in the industry as a whole. Because, like, I mean, we say that we care so much about ethics and right practices, and, you know, we don't. And we say that we care so much about making the story the story, but yet some of us seem to think that our Twitter accounts are there for us to post pictures of ourselves doing our jobs, and we think we're important when it's like it's never been about us, it's never going to be about us. Like, it should be about the people we cover, the stories we cover, how it matters, and and more importantly, it should be about the readers because at the end of the day, like, they are the ones who are making this happen, and when you put them second and yourself first, like, you have no reason to be in this. Like, I mean, you, you really don't, and so... Things like that frustrate me. I mean, I think it's the lack of ethics that frustrate me. I mean, a lack of diversity. I wish there was more ethnic minorities and women's in position of of prominence and of power. I mean, things like that about the industry, like, really, really frustrate me. But is that, do you see that more specifically in the sports side of it or in just all across? I think you're seeing it all across just because, I mean, like, God, how serious do we want to get here? Like, I even look at Denver, for example. Like, to me, this is such a large market. And the fact that you don't see more women that are writers, that are reporters, that are on TV. The fact you don't see more ethnic minorities, like to me, it's challenging because like you hear people say like, oh, well, we just can't find people. And it's like, no, you can find people. Well, oh, we can't bring them here. It's Denver. You can bring them here. Like just about th- everybody wants to be yeah. like you have 300 days of sunshine. You have mountains. I know people here complain about like how bad the traffic is, but it's like we came from the West Coast. We were there beforehand. Traffic here is fun. Yeah, it is. It is fun. There are so many things to do. I mean, you have great restaurants. I mean, granted, you have some places that you try to get a New York style pizza, and they're like, "We have plant based pepperoni," and it's like, "No, pepperoni's not coming with plants." Big bills in Centennial, Colorado. <laughs> I will. Tell okay, you that. thank if you. If you're looking for New York style pizza, that's where you go. Yeah, yeah. That's so, just, so no, no ju- plug here. No, know. no, fair enough. But um, <laughs> you're bleep that. Out. But but but, uh, <laughs> but but no. But I mean, so it's just stuff like that. But I guess just kind of going back to like our initial conversation. So, yeah, I graduated college at the University of Maine, and then. Um, went to Richmond, Indiana, where I covered cops, courts, fire, business, Indiana high school, basketball, Texas. Second job was in Texas, where I covered the oil industry, then high school that football. Sounds like, that sounds like one of those jobs in the smaller markets yep. where you're doing just about everything, and you're cleaning the floor, too, yeah. and then getting your copy in. Yeah. Third, third job, I covered hockey in Fargo, North Dakota. Fourth job was um, a news job in Lansing that was only short, because we'd moved there for my wife's career. And then, um, yeah, then I guess you could say it came my big break. I got offered a job at the South Florida Sun Sentinel to go cover high schools and to turn in the high schools and doing some dolphins and colleges and other stuff. Then I went to go cover FSU for Yahoo. And then I got hired by the Tacoma News Tribune to cover the Seattle, uh, we'll cover the Washington Huskies. And then, yeah, one day I got a phone call from the athletic and they were like, how would you feel about covering the Colorado avalanche? And I'm like, yeah, the NHL's always been my dream. And so yeah, that's how we ended up here in Denver. What's your perspective when you get a phone call like that? I mean, was were the abs a team that you followed before uh, or was this a, a break into the NHL for you? I think with the phone call itself, it's something I didn't see coming just because with the NHL, and I mean, my wife would attest to this, like it had it'd been something that like we had both strived for. Like, in fact, she's going to get embarrassed when I say this. Like we had maybe been together two months and we had a very serious idea of where this was going. And she even said, your career comes first. She's like, you've been at this longer. You want it She's more. nodding. She, um, she agrees with this. She's so, backing that up. Thank I you. see this from across the room. But, uh, but no, but to be serious. So, I mean, like we, we kind of knew like, okay, this was the goal. And after coming close so many times and, and, and falling short with different papers, some big ones at that, you just said, forget it. So we had moved to Seattle. And even though the News Tribune, which is owned by McClatchy, was going through financial hardship, like it was so bad there that I almost got laid off. But if someone hadn't taken a buyout, but even then I still wanted to stay because like we loved Seattle. Like it's a gorgeous city. It's a great place. People care about the Huskies. Like we were fine spending the rest of our lives in Seattle. Like we had talked about buying a house the whole nine. And then when you get that phone call, like everything changes because it's one of those things where 
you have that going on. And then there were some interviews I did to also cover the NHL for some other really prominent newspapers. And it's like, it's everything you've ever wanted, but you weren't expecting it. And like, you can ask her, like we were at a Mariners game and like, we're having serious conversations. Like, do we move back to the East Coast? Do we move back to Florida? Do we move to Denver? Do we move to, you know, Southern California? Do we move back to Buffalo? Because home for me is a weird mix between like Toronto, the East Coast and South Florida. Buffalo is only an hour away. My best friend lives there. So, I mean, like, again, it's just all these choices. And like, I mean, yeah, it was just, it was a, it, here's the thing, like choosing to come here wasn't hard, but like, it was just really like emotional because it hits you all at once. Like, wow, this is happening. Yeah. And you're covering a sport that you love. Yeah. I mean, what, what's your, what's your tie to hockey? Um, well, I mean, again, just having ties to East Coast in Toronto, I mean, like you just always grew up watching it and I just always enjoyed the game, but I think what was so different for it for me was just like, I think every other sport, like you, like we know so much about football living in the United States and North America as a whole to where like we can sit here and can explain the complexities of a three, four, four, three defense defense. It's not really hard. Or we can explain like, you know, different wide receiver routes or what it means to chip on the offensive line. With basketball, there's complexity to it. There's personality. But at the same time, it's one of those things where it's kind of growing in baseball. It's always a national pastime. I think hockey, even if you're in Canada, like I think there's just something really unique about just, again, the way the sport works in terms of the actual strategy of it, the backstories of some of these kids. So like, tell you, we'll use someone like Kale McCarr, for example. Like, I mean, just talking to him and his dad and his mom just about like everything like they kind of went through in the sense of getting him here. Like he had been cut from teams for being too small. He wasn't always the quickest kid, which again, that's kind of strange to think given what he's done. But he is now, yeah. And then Who like was the quickest kid and where can we sign yeah, him? No kidding. And, then, <laughs> and then the thing was, is just so to go to UMass and write that big profile about him, like at Amherst, like it was insane because like you go to a school like UMass, which hasn't always been great at hockey and you go there and he's the most popular kid on campus. And like, there are people actually having legitimate questions. Like, is he in the lexicon of athlete of Julius Irving, Marcus Camby at UMass? Like that is saying a lot. And so like, that's what I think just kind of drew me to hockey that, and it sounds really strange, but like, don't get me wrong. I love being on a football field. It's great. Baseball diamond, same thing. Basketball court, definitely. There's something about a hockey But rink. there is like this strange <laughs> calm and peace I find like when I'm at a hockey rink. So like I think about like earlier this past season when like my mom died, like my mom died like four hours before t uh, puck drop. And like, I think everyone who found out after the fact was like, why are you here? Even my wife was like, don't go. And I'm like, no. And I went and it was just like, even though like I thought about my mom, like it was the most calming thing to be in that rink. Cause I just feel like a bomb could go off outside. And it's like, there's just something about being at the rink where it's like, well, if that's where I go, that's where I go. And you're talking about at Pepsi center. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you felt that kind of solace in there. Yeah. Because I mean, like, it's just one of those things where like, for me, it was something like I always grew up watching. And like, I always had fun with it. And it was just always something that like, no matter like what was going on, I could always watch a hockey game. And I just felt like absolutely better about everything. Like, so this is a story that like, maybe only four people know. So she knows, my best friend knows. And I told my brother this summer. I think we can add maybe two or three. After yeah, this yeah. Upstairs. So what it was when I was a kid, my parents were seriously thinking about getting a divorce. So like my mom and I, we were living with my grandmother and so it was the 94 Stanley Cup between the Canucks and, and the Rangers. And I watched it every single day. I read about it every single day. And for me, like, it's the thing that you, you watch as a kid that helps you get your mind off the fact that, like, my family might be separated. And, of course, that didn't happen. But it's just for me, that's just kind of what it was. It was just, like, it was that outlet. It was that release. And it wasn't because of the violence or anything like that. It was just more to do with the fact that, like, it was just such a fascinating game in the sense of, like, the Rangers hadn't won a cup in forever. And you mm -hmm. had these players like Messier and Graves and Leach and Richter who were really good. But then you look at the Canucks and just like how long like Vancouver has really tried to make it happen. And like you have a guy like Trevor Linden who like he was a phenomenal player. You have Pavel Bure who's a Hall of Famer, Alexander McGillney. I mean, you had some really good talent, some compelling stories. So yeah, I kind of think for me, like I think once that happened, I was like, yeah, if I could do this for the rest of my life, I'd certainly do it. And here you are. I know, it's strange. You're, so how many seasons are you in now? I'm going into season number two. Season two. Yeah. Do you think you're, you you want to linger here? Do you like it here? Uh, I hate it. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Denver is horrible. No, right. I mean, yeah. Hopefully the bosses are listening. You know? Yeah. No, I mean, look, we're we're really happy in Denver. I mean, we, we really do like it. I mean, I would say the hardest part was coming from Seattle because I don't know if you have ever spent time there, but to come from Seattle... It's like there's mountains and there's trees and there's water and lots like, of it. And like the other year round. Yeah. And the, and the thing is, I mean, it, it, here's the thing. Like 
it rains, but it's not heavy. But the thing about living in Seattle, and I feel like an old man saying this, I'm only 35, but like the thing that people have to realize about Seattle is for those of us of a certain age, which I think the three of us fall within, Seattle's always been an important part of pop culture in a sense mm-hmm. of like Frasier was the top 10 show on television, My, the rise of Microsoft, Nintendo was headquartered there, Griffey, the music scene with Pearl Jam, Nirvana, nice. Soundgarden. I mean, Sir mix a is from Seattle. You think about those old Sonics teams as well. Um, I mean, it's just, it's always kind of been a place. And not only that, but like, it's the home of like 10 Fortune 500 companies like Amazon, Nordstrom, um, you name it. Like there's a lot of, you know, influence that that area has had. So I'd always kind of wanted to live there. And so like, it was hard to leave, but to come to Denver, I mean, like, look, yeah, th- there's not the Pacific Ocean, but at the same time, like there's a lot of things we really enjoy about Denver. Um, but yeah, I, I think we'd probably want to end up staying. What's the what's your favorite story you've written on the app since you've been here? I can tell you what mine is. Go ahead. My story that you wrote. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, is the story on Matt Nieto and getting to the bottom of why Matt Nieto keeps the number. And I won't steal your thunder. No, 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 no. So no how did no. that come out? So what it was, um, was we at The Athletic were doing a story. As, uh, like every city was doing a story about someone who does community service and just kind of like, who would that local sports person of the year be and, and writing about their community service? And with Matt Nieto, what it was was uh, he gives his game tickets to children with Down syndrome and autism. So one day I spoke with Matt um, after practice for like about 20 minutes. And I was like, hey, what makes you do this? And he's like, well, I have a sister who has Down syndrome and autism. And like he explained like, you know, this is what he learned. Like this is what, you know, he, he loves about his sister, their relationship and just how great it is. So there was a couple weeks had passed, and I was like, hey, do you mind if I speak to your mom? And so he was like, yeah. So he got injured, and I waited for him to get healthy. And so it was right after, like, the big Kale McCarr story. Well, like, one of three big Kale McCarr stories yeah. came out. <laughs> and so, like, I called Mary Nieto, who's a sweetheart. And, you know, I'm sitting on press row just by myself. And um, we just started talking, you know, just about, like, Matt and his sister. And she was like, yeah. He was like, you know, his sister, Erin, she's nonverbal. She speaks about... 20 words like every time Matt's on TV she goes Matt Matt and you know she says 83 and you know I told Matt that and Matt was like that's the reason I can't change my number because she's nonverbal and she can say my number and she can say things like avalanche and so like it's one of those things like when you hear it you're just like wow so like the first person I told after this was Connor McGahey he's one of my really close friends and I was like this happened and like he started crying in the press box. Like, I mean, like it really, it really struck a chord with people. And so we wrote this story and with something like that, like, and this sounds really selfish. You hope it does well on social in a sense of like, you hope people see this because like, it's a really cool story. I could care less about metrics and all that. Like, it's just more about, Hey, you hope like this guy's story gets out there. And then next thing you know, I'm on a plane to Calgary and like I checked the in-flight Wi-Fi and it's been retweeted over a thousand times. Wow. Yeah. I, 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 that story just blew me away. When, I, when you tweeted it initially and I did not have a membership to The Athletic at the time and I got a membership that day. <laughs> uh, and that's the thank reason you. I subscribed to The Athletic. Ryan, I can't thank you enough for coming in and hanging out. I, I hear that we're running out of tape. One of these days we will get larger. One, one of these days we'll buy more tape. You'd think we were like a newspaper. <laughs> we buy ink by the barrel. We don't buy tape by the barrel, apparently. So thank you for coming by. Of course. Thanks for having Appreciate me. Appreciate it, as always. Uh, to all of you out there, thank you for listening. Uh, Ryan, we're going to have him in all the time to help us figure out things, but we'll do Yay. it by phone so you don't have to be on camera. No, <laughs> no, I mean, it's fine. I'll just wear a mask. Like, I'm sure you guys have seen the Stone Cold E.T. <laughs> thing where there's a guy who puts on an E.T. mask and he sounds like Stone Cold Steve Austin. I'll just do that. Perfect. <laughs> Works for me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, should I, I should probably play the uh, mask. We'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of Steve Stager and Jeff Sautel, who have absolutely no business covering sports at all. They're just fans. You can tell them how wrong they are by tweeting at the show at 9 Cheap Seats or email cheapseats at 9news.com.